somebody else. No, I want somebody who can use it. I've had it for about three or four years. I'm finally redoing all the cable in my house. I bought 50. Tuckland Baptist, tomorrow night there's going to be a joint uh, sponsored event over at the United Orthodox Synagogue, which is at South Brazewood in Green Willow. That's inside the loop, right where North Brazewood crosses Braze Bayou and becomes South Brazewood between 610 and Stella Link. And they're having an ID, it's at 7 o'clock, and they're having an IDF general speaking, speak uh, tomorrow night about things that are going on in Israel. So if any of y'all are interested, let me know so I can let them know, because I'm supposed to RSVP how many people might I might be bringing. So I told them six, so I think we've, we don't have that many yet, so. Anyhow, that's tomorrow night at 7 over there, and then um, I think that's the only, only other announcement. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers, and the flower fades. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, let's have a few moments of silent prayer so we can make sure we're in fellowship. And a silent prayer to give you the opportunity to confess any sins to God that you're aware of that need to be confessed. And then uh, I will begin, uh, I will open in prayer. So a few moments of silent prayer, then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful we can be here this evening because we have freedom in this nation, freedom to assemble, freedom to study your word, freedom to uh, proclaim the truth as it is, proclaim the truth of your word, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we do pray that for our nation that you would open the eyes of the leadership so that they might understand the reality of the uh, situation, the enormity of the situation that we face economically. Uh, militarily, the security that we face, both in terms of securing our borders as well as uh, what we face in terms of radical Islam and the tremendous danger and threat that exists out there, both in terms of those who have slipped into this nation and are sleepers, uh, waiting for some signal, some event, and also those who are on the battlefield. Father, we continue to pray for our troops, pray for our leaders pray for the support that this nation will give them uh, as they are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom on the field of battle. Now, Father, as we study your word, may we be encouraged this evening as we come to think about you a little more precisely, come to understand your word a little better, that we might be uh, encouraged and motivated uh, spiritually to continue to pursue excellence in our spiritual life. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we are in Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21, and tonight, as we get into the next couple of verses, specifically verses 5 and 6, we are going to get into a review of the doctrine of the Trinity, and a doctrine that, know, that is known as perichoresis, that's not perichoresis, as somebody suggested, that's perichoresis. I don't think anybody here has probably ever studied that doctrine before. So uh, that will give you something new to look, anticipate this evening. So we'll look at plurality in the Godhead, of the Trinity, and perichoresis. What we've seen so far in this chapter is that the time shifts to a time in the future beyond the millennial kingdom after the Great white throne judgment. John sees another vision in verse 1 of a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and first earth pass away. So it's clear that this is a new stage, new universe is created with some different dynamics. The geophysical laws that operated during this time period between uh, the, the Noahic flood and now are different from that which preceded the Noahic flood and that which will come after the millennial kingdom. So just we just don't live in a static universe, though God has uh, created it in such a way that he oversees it and we do have stability. 
So there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and as part of the new earth, there will be a new Jerusalem, which we began to study last time, and we'll come back to when we get down to verse 9. It's more of the focus there. But at this stage, it's more of a summation dealing with uh, the spiritual life uh, in the new heavens and new earth, as well as the role of, I think, primarily church age believers. What happens to church age believers in the new heavens and new earth? We rule and reign with Christ during the millennial kingdom, but what about uh, beyond that? And so we get into that in verses 7 and 8. But as a an introduction to that, we focus on on the person of God, the person who is sitting on the throne uh, in verse um uh, in verse 5. And so we read, looking at verse 5, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, and so the me is John the Apostle, and he is being addressed by the one who sits on the throne, who, as we'll see, is God the Father. He's given the command to write, for these words are true and faithful. Now, I want you to, we're going to go back and forth on some things within Revelation, some things I have up on slides, other things I don't. And every now and then I think I put too many things up on slides because I'm afraid people aren't um, just jotting down cross-references in their margin. I put things up on the up on the screen so that we don't spend a lot of time having to play sword drill during Bible class and and uh, look around at a lot of different verses when I just want to move through them rather uh, rather quickly. But if you turn back to Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, Revelation starting in verse uh, 9 in Revelation chapter 1, we are introduced to this vision that the Apostle John had while he was on the Isle of Patmos. And while he's on the Isle of Patmos, he sees a vision. He hears a voice like a, a, a loud sound, a, a loud noise, like a trumpet. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ addressing him. And he, wants, he addresses him in light of these churches that represent the church down through the, down through the ages of the church age. Then in verse 19, the Lord Jesus Christ commissions him and states, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. And that gives us our structure for the, for the book of Revelation. The things which you have seen from that perspective of Jesus addressing John on the Isle of Patmos. It's what he has seen up to that point. The things which are, and that covers the next section in Revelation, Revelation 2 and 3, the seven letters to the seven churches. And then the things which will take place after this. And that's almost an identical phrase after this to Revelation 4.1, when John says, after these things I saw, and that covers the future part. So that gives us the, the framework, the three parts to Revelation chapter 1 as part 1, 2 and 3 as part 2, and then chapters 4 through 22 as the things which will take place after this, the future things. So the command is to write the things which we, you have seen. Now, if you go back to verse 5 of Revelation 21, he's given this same command, write. But now the one who is addressing him isn't the son. It is the, it is the one who is sitting on the throne, and we'll see in our study this evening that that is and can only be uh, God the Father, right? For these things are true and faithful. Now that's also interesting because the one who appears to uh, John on the Isle of Patmos is the one who is true and faithful. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there is a... Um, there is, is almost, as it were, a play on words here because the words, the word for words is logos. It's in the plural here. Logos is also a title for the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is the one who is faithful and true. So there is, it, it's showing this close connection between the Father and the Son. And that's what we'll get into when we get into the doctrine of perichoresis. 
This is an important doctrine that's been taught as part of the doctrine of Trinity down through the the, uh, centuries, but one that is not very well understood as the doctrine of the Trinity isn't always uh, very well understood. So the first thing we ought to ask if we approach uh, the passage is to, to define and determine who it is who is sitting on the throne. Now, if you come out of a Presbyterian, Episcopal, Lutheran uh, background, some Baptist backgrounds, Calvinistic, uh, especially in eschatology, amillennial or postmillennial background, then it, the distinctions here really get confusing because as far as they're concerned, those who hold to a, an amill or postmill view believe that when Jesus ascended, he sat on his throne and he sat on the throne of David that's a spiritual throne in heaven. And at that point, he became the king, and he begins to to rule at that particular point. Now, remember, amillennialism is a combination of an alpha or a prefix, which is a negation, and the uh, word millennial or millenarian from the Latin milli meaning a thousand, and it means no thousand-year reign. What it refers to is that in ah millennialism, they did not believe in a literal 1,000 year earthly kingdom. Then post millennialism uh, grew out of ah millennialism, still spiritualizing or allegor- allegorizing those uh, the various passages related to the kingdom. But for them, the church, which has replaced Israel, so that's where you get the term replacement theology. The church replaces Israel. Israel is irrelevant to the plan of God completely, in their view. And the church gradually brings in the kingdom, or to give them, you know, the, uh, the fairest shake I can. Their view is that the Holy Spirit working in the church, uh, expands the fruit of evangelism more and more until everybody is saved, and then the kingdom comes in, and after the kingdom comes in, then Jesus returns. So his return is at the end of the kingdom. It's not a Jewish kingdom. It's not a literal thousand-year kingdom, but it is a an earthly kingdom, and Jesus comes only after it has been established. Whereas in premillennialism, Jesus comes first, and he defeats the Antichrist and the false prophet and then establishes his kingdom. Now, all of these things are interrelated because you have to understand what a kingdom is. And that's not always easy to do because there's two senses in which you have a kingdom. You have kingdom in terms of the sovereign reign of God over his creation. And so in that broad sense, God the Father is viewed as a as a king, as the sovereign ruling over his creation. But on the other hand, we have the introduction and prophecy of a kingdom. You have the literal theocratic kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament, as well as the prophecy of an earthly kingdom that will be one uh, where the curse is rolled back, the lion will lie down with the lamb, what we've studied uh, as the messianic kingdom. So that is... Um, that the idea of kingdom is very important because in the Old Testament, this kingdom was foretold. Then when John the Baptist and Jesus and Jesus' disciples came along and they started announcing, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the kingdom is never defined by them. You have to go to the Old Testament to understand to what that word referred. And it refers to this, this literal earthly kingdom that would uh, be ruled by an heir of David. And so that would be upon the earth. So the whole idea of kingdom and an earthly reign are, are, are intimately related. And, of course, to have a kingdom, you have to have a king. And a king ha- rules upon his throne. So you, the words throne and kingdom are uh, intimately related. And so when we come to verse verse 5, we read about this one who is sitting on the throne. Now, is that the Father? Is that the Son? Just who exactly is this? And the way to address this is that you have to go back to the beginning of the book of Revelation and see how the word throne uh, is, going, is used. 
And that helps us to understand this, and you just have to take your time to go through all the passages, and we're going to hit a good bit of them and some of them fairly quickly just because I, I want to make a point that a lot of people miss when they go through Revelation. Now, just to remind you, a lot of you weren't here when we started. I went through some of this when we started. Now we're going back and reviewing a lot of those initial things uh, as we come to an end, as we begin to wrap up uh, wrap up our study in Revelation. So the first time we see this phrase is in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then he gives his, uh, his salutation, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was, and who is to come. Now here we have a title for one member of the Trinity. He is the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. Now a lot of people focus on that last phrase, who is to come, and they think that's Jesus because they focus on Revelation 19, that Jesus is coming. And so there are those who have made the mistake of interpreting this in terms of Jesus, but that doesn't work because as we saw last time in verse 3 of Revelation 21.3, the tabernacle of God uh, will be with men. God, the Father, will take up his residence upon the earth. All three members of the Trinity will take up residence upon uh, upon the earth. So John to the seven churches says, Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And that phrase is used several times in Revelation, and so you have to trace that as you go through, and you realize that it always refers to the one who is sitting on the throne. And you have to, it's, it's, it's like being a kid, and you have to connect the dots. You have, because you don't always have the same phrases together, but you have the, the same general group of phrases together, but they're not all present every time. The one who sits on the throne is described as the one who is and who was and who is to come. He's also, as we'll see, going to be described as God or the Lord God. He will also be described as the Almighty. And what we'll see is that those phrases, Lord God, Lord God Almighty, the Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, all relate to the one who sits on the throne. And none of those titles in the book of Revelation are ever used to refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's interesting because you look at some passages and you can kind of scratch your head a little bit and think, well, it's sort of, we, couldn't we apply this to Jesus? And then on top of that, you have, have another problem in uh, Revelation chapter 1 with some textual problems where a couple of words got inserted in the Textus Receptus. They're not in the majority text. They're not in the... Uh, Nestle Island text, the uh, eclectic text or critical text, and they were probably they were just in a few rare documents. And so, if you grew up on the King James version and you read Revelation one seven and one eight, you probably did, never got that identified as the right person because of the textual problem that's there. And you get rid of the textual problem, you realize it's not talking, Revelation 1.8 isn't talking about the Son, it's talking about the Father. And we'll look at that in a minute. So that just kind of gets your curiosity going a little bit. So we see here that the one who is and who was and who is to come is the one from whom the message comes, grace to you and peace, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now the his there refers to the one who is and who was and who is to come. That second person singular uh, pronoun there related to the throne ties us to the one who is and was and who is to come because that phrase is always connected to the one who is on the throne. And so you have two persons here. You have the one who's sitting on the throne, and you want you have the seven spirits who are before his throne, which is a uh, an allusion to the fullness of, of the ministry of God the Holy Spirit it comes from Isaiah uh, 61, uh, 61.1 and talks about the fullness of this Holy Spirit's ministry. Now the next time we have the mention of a throne in terms of heaven is in Revelation 3.21, which comes at the end of the two chapters that are related to the seven letters to the seven churches. And at the end of each one of those letters, if you remember going way back two or three years ago, and we studied that, or four or five years ago, is that those 
uh, there is a promise of reward at the end, or, or in some cases a promise of discipline at the end of each one of those report cards to those seven churches. And at the end of the seventh one, there is the promise to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. So you have to ask the question, who's speaking here? And the one who's speaking here is Jesus. He says to, the, to him who overcomes, I will grant. What f- part of speech is that? I mean, what's the parsing of that, that verb? Is it present tense, past tense, or future tense? It's a future tense verb in the Greek. It's a future tense active indicative of didomi, uh, meaning to give or to grant or to bestow, something along those lines. And so Jesus is talking, says, to him who overcomes, I will in the future grant him to sit with me on my throne. So the, this reference to Jesus, to a throne in relation to Jesus, is something that is future, not present. And then he goes on to say, as I also overcame, past tense, aorist tense there, as I also overcame, this, this happened right before he went to the cross, because Jesus said in John, uh, John 16, I have overcome the world, a perfect active indicative of the verb, meaning completed action. Before he went to the cross, he overcame the world. The world is always the object of that verb to overcome. He didn't overcome sin on the cross. He overcame the world in terms of his life, in terms of his spiritual life, and not yielding to temptation. So he says to those who overcome, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame. And what? At the ascension, he did what? He sat down with my father, on his throne. The sitting down is known as the session, the seating of Christ from a Latin word, sessiona, meaning to sit. And so when he ascended to heaven, he didn't sit on his throne. He sat on the Father's throne. And he is still seated at the Father's right hand, still seated on the Father's throne. And he will not sit on his own throne until the kingdom is given to him. And that doesn't occur until... He prepares to return to the earth. That's why he's given the uh, seven seal scroll in Revelation 4 and 5. He still doesn't have a throne. And he, when he, it's only when he comes to the earth that he will then take a, his throne. So in Revelation 3.21, the throne is the Father's throne. Then we come to Revelation 5.13. Now, if you remember, in Revelation 4 and 5, we have a heavenly introduction to the tribulation period. In the heavenly introduction, you have the throne room scene. Before the throne room, you have the four living creatures and the 24 elders who represent the uh, risen, rewarded, raptured, resurrected church age believers. And then there is this hue and cry that goes forth seeking someone who can open the seven sealed scroll that is lying in the hand of the father who is sitting on the throne. And so you have the mention of the 24 elders before the throne. You have the mention of the four living creatures before the throne. You have the mention of the, in Revelation 5, one of the one who is sitting on the throne. And in his right hand, there is a uh, seven sealed scroll. And the search goes forth, who is worthy to open the scroll? And they search high and low and they can't find anybody. And it's so bad that, that, that John begins to weep loudly because no one can be found worthy to open the scroll. And so the angel comforts him and tells him that they would have found someone. It is the lamb who is worthy, the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. He is the one who is worthy to open the scroll. And so then we have two personages now. We have the father on the throne, the one who's sitting on the throne with the scroll in his open hand. And then we have the lamb who comes before the throne. So you can't make the son, the lamb, the second person of the Trinity, identical to the one sitting on the throne. They are distinct personalities, distinct persons. And so in verse 13, we read, "...and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne." That's the Father. "...and to the Lamb forever and ever." So they're not the same. So the one on the throne is the Father, the one before the throne is the Lamb. And then we come to another verse, Revelation six sixteen. This occurs at the end of the sixth seal judgment when the uh, leaders of the, the, the earth dwellers 
are under assault from this heavenly asteroid barrage, and they cry out to the mountains and the peaks, mountains and the rocks, rather, fall on us and hide us from the face of who? The face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Again, two distinct personages, the one on the throne and the Lamb. The Lamb's not on the throne yet. So that's Revelation uh, 6, 16. Then there's an interlude that occurs in Revelation chapter 7. You always have in the chronology of Revelation, remember, you have your forward momentum of your seven judgments, the seal judgments, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then there's an interlude in the next chapter that takes us back to look at something, some other things that are going on during the forward progression of seals 1 through 6. Then we'll go to trumpets 1 through 7. And we'll go through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then in Revelation 10 through 14, there's another interlude where it comes back and talks about a bunch of other things that are going on during the same time as those trumpet judgments. So here in Revelation uh, 7, uh, we have about four key verses. In verse 9, we read, After these things, that's the first scene that John sees in verses 1 through 8, the sealing of the 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Notice once again, there's this distinction before the throne, God the Father, and before the Lamb. Verse 10, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne. Now, who sits on the throne? God. Theos never refers to Jesus in, in Revelation. Theos is used some 83 times, I think it is, in the book of Revelation. And Theos always refers to the Father, never refers to the Son. So uh, you have uh, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Then verse 15, therefore they are before the throne of God, that's the living creatures and the 24 elders, and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Look at that. That's, we've seen so far, Jesus isn't the one on the throne. The one on the throne is the Father. And here we see that the one on the throne will dwell among them. That's the focus in Revelation isn't Jesus coming to dwell among men, but the Father coming to dwell among men in Revelation 21. So he who sits on the throne will dwell among them, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. Now notice the important distinction there. The one who sits on the throne is going to dwell among them. The lamb is going to shepherd them. You want to say anything about that? Usually lambs get shepherded, right? little juxtaposition of ideas that are supposed to get your attention. Uh, they didn't have bold face or italics, so they used imagery and words and uh, sentence structure, things like that, to get our attention. The lamb who's in the... Notice he's not on the throne, He's in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. Now, remember that, because when we get into uh, Revelation uh, 21 here, we're going to talk about, and and into 22, we're going to talk about the uh, living waters that are um, free to those who uh, will drink them. So, uh, it is the shepherd. It is the Lamb who shepherds them, leads them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. And that connects to, uh, if you're making a note in your Bible, as you should be in Revelation seven seventeen, you should be noting that that connects to Revelation twenty one four. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, notice it's God in in seven seventeen. And it's God in 21.4. That's not Jesus. That's the Father who will wipe away every tear from our eyes and is the one who will take away all of our sorrows and pains and grief. And I think this is important because so often we've so emphasized the person of Jesus and the pre-incarnate Jesus and we've overemphasized the passage in John 1 that no one has seen the Father at any time, but the Son, is the only begotten, has explained him, that we've almost removed, edited the Father out of 
any involvement with humanity throughout the Old Testament. All those appearances in the Old Testament uh, have to be the Son. They can't be the Father. And I think we have misinterpreted the significance of John 1. And Because if you take it that way, then the Father is so distant, it's almost like he's a deistic God. He's just way off there somewhere in the throne. But the picture that we have of God in Revelation 21 is that he's the one coming to dwell among us. He's the one who wipes away every tear. So what I hope we'll, we get out of this is it makes the Father more personal and more personally involved with the individual believer and less distant, which is unfortunately the way some of these passages have been handled. And that's why it's important to understand perichoresis. And I didn't invent perichoresis. It's been around for almost since the, probably the 4th century. But it's just a term that isn't on everybody's lips, and so we have to understand it a little better. Okay, Revelation 12.5. This is the... Uh, image, the scene where John looks and sees a woman, and the woman has uh, 12 stars around her head, and the woman is, is represents Israel. And the woman goes and gives birth to a male child. And the male child is, and that's a depiction of, of Israel giving birth to the Messiah, who is to rule all nations with the rod of iron. phrases comes out of Psalm 2 indicating that this is indeed the Messiah. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. Again, the throne refers to the Father. Then we go, skip ahead to Revelation 19.4, the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne, saying, Amen and Alleluia. Then we come to Revelation 22.1 and 3, and there we read, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, uh, clear as crystal, pre- proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. This is the first time that we see the Lamb on the throne. Up until Revelation 22, which is new heavens and new earth, the Lamb does, doesn't sit on the throne. He sits on the Father's throne, and then we know from Old Testament passages he will sit on David's throne and rule over Israel, but this is the first time in Revelation that the Lamb is on a throne. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So when we run through all of those passages, we see that the the throne of God is always a reference to God the Father. Second thing we see is Theos, which is used 87 times. I think I said 82 before, but it's 87 times always refers to God the Father, and you have it as God or Lord God, or in many cases, Lord God Almighty. The uh, Lamb, uh, the se- or Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is sometimes referred to as the Lamb. That's the favorite title that John has for the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, he uses that title uh, some 27 times in uh, in the book of Revelation, he's called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's called the Son of God, uh, Son of Man. All of these are various other titles that are used that identify him as the second person of the Trinity. And so we read in Revelation 21 now, Then he who sat on the throne, that this is clearly a reference to the Father. So now the next thing we have to discern as we look at this is is that he is speaking. So God the Father is speaking to John. And he says, Behold, I make all things new. Behold, I make all things new. And this is the uh, Greek word, uh, kine, which indicates that it is an integral newness. It is not simply a revision. It is something that is uh, completely uh, and integrally new. So he says, behold, I will make, I make all things new. So he's making the new heavens and new earth and new Jerusalem. And then John writes, and he, that is the father, said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And as I pointed out, that uh, alludes to and brings out a connection between words and the title Logos for the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as the fact that true and faithful are 
uh, adjectives that are used uh, to describe uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you go back to uh, Revelation 19.11, when the Lord Jesus Christ is, uh, comes at the head of an army, we read, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His head were like many crowns. He had a name written that no one, except, no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the, the Word of God, the Logos of God. So John 21.5 connects these things together so we understand that there is clearly a, an allusion here to, to the second person of the Trinity. And then we come to uh, verse 6. Verse 6 says, And he said to me, that is the Father, says, It is done, meaning it is complete, the plan is complete. And then he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Now earlier we saw that that, that the Lamb is going to lead those to, to that water. But it is the Father here who says, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Now, as we look at this verse, there are two titles that relate to deity here, Alpha and Omega. And I bet every one of us, if I gave you a multiple choice quiz and said, to whom does Alpha and Omega, I'm the Alpha and the Omega apply? Now, I bet almost all of you would say that that applied to the Son. And you would be wrong because it applies to the Father. And the reason people think that it applies to the Son, it does apply to the Son in one passage in Revelation 22. But in Revelation chapter 1, you might as well turn back. We're going to hit several passages in Revelation chapter 1. But in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, we read, I am the Alpha and the Omega... The beginning and the end. Now, the beginning and the end is usually associated with Jesus. But the beginning and the end isn't found in the critical text or in the majority text. That's only in the Texas Receptus. So that, that caused people to misidentify who was speaking here as the Alpha and the Omega. This is not the Son speaking in 1.8. It's the Father speaking. And then it goes on to say... Uh, says the Lord in the King James and New King James. But the majority text says the Lord God. Critical text says Lord God. Um, that is substantiated by your early, uh, uh, early, early versions as well. And when it's Lord God, it's, who's it talking about? It's talking about the Father. So verse 8 isn't talking about the Son. The Son isn't saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. It is the Father who says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And that's your next line of evidence there. The Almighty only refers to the Father. So verse 8 isn't talking about the Son. It has to be talking about, uh, about the Father. So in verse 6, we <clears throat> begin to look at uh, who this is that, speak, that is speaking here. And we see that this is uh, must refer to must refer to God the Father. Uh, for example, Revelation one six, He made us kings and priests to His God and Father. The construction there identifies God with Father, and that sets that's the first time we find God related uh, in this way in 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 Revelation. Just uh, demonstrating that from that point on, we can see that God only refers that also only refers to uh, to the Father. Uh, Revelation 22.13 is the other place that mentions the Alpha and the Omega. And there we see that this does apply to the Lord Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> it applies to both because the Father's eternal, the Son's eternal. It would also apply to the Holy Spirit, although it's never stayed that way because He's eternal. And that is that. That's the point. But in Revelation uh, one eight, Revelation twenty one six, it is a clear reference to uh, to the uh, to the Father, and only in Revelation twenty two uh, thirteen is it connected to 
uh, to the Son. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now, going back to some of the other, the other key phrases that are here, we recognize, I pointed out already, the one who is and who was and who is to come is the one on the throne, that's the Father, as we see in Revelation 1.4. I've mentioned, but I haven't gone through the passages yet, that uh, the Father is also the one that's described as the Almighty. Revelation 4, 8. This is in the, the scene before the throne of God with the 24 elders and the four living creatures. Uh, verse 8 of Revelation 4 says, The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they, did not, they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. See, we have Almighty, who was and is and is to come, all tied to the one on the throne. So this is clearly a reference to the Father. In another scene of heavenly praise, in Revelation eleven seventeen, we read, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, Pantocrator there again, the one who is and who was and who is to come. So the one on the throne is the Almighty, and is the one who was and who is uh, and who is to come. And notice the last part of that says, because you have taken your great power and reigned. And it's not the Son. So I think this is one of those things that people get really confused about because uh, in a lot of streams of evangelicalism, there's a lot of talk about King Jesus. And Jesus reigning on his throne now, and uh, we need to serve the king. And, and there's no place in the scriptures that talk about the kingdom being a present reality. It is a future reality, but it's not a present reality. There's, and Jesus isn't referred to as the king, and his authority as the king is never the basis for challenges, exhortations, and commands to church-age believers. He commands us because he is the head of the body. He is, but not because he's the king. Not once do you find the Apostle Paul ever saying, you need to obey Jesus as your king. Never. He says he is the head of the body, the church, and we need to obey him for that, uh, for that reason. So there is no uh, present kingdom. There, he is not the king, and the only reference to kings and reigning is, at this stage, pre-second coming, is the Father. And this is emphasized again in Revelation 15.3. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Notice again the distinction between God, referencing God the Father and the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. It's got to be the Father. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Now, saints is not limited to church age believers. You always have to, when you ever see the word saints, you have to understand who it's uh, talking about. Uh, Old Testament believers are saints, church age believers are saints, tribulation believers are saints. Saints is just a term that means sanctified ones. Uh, it's roughly comparable to the word we use just to describe believers. And a believer can have any dispensation. It can be called a believer. The term is not dispensationally uh, distinct. And so here we have Lord God Almighty as the king, but not the lamb. The lamb's not the king yet. As late as Revelation 3, he's not the king yet. Revelation 16, 7, I heard another uh, voice from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Again, referencing the, the one who sits on the throne. Revelation sixteen fourteen. For they are spirits of demons performing signs. These are those three demons that go out from the uh, 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 Antichrist. These are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. It's talking about the Father, not the Son, even though he's the one who's going to come back and destroy the, uh, the enemies of God. Uh, Revelation 19.6, at the beginning of that uh, Armageddon <coughs> final battle description, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God, that's the Father, 
the Lord God omnipotent reigns. See, what we're developing here is a patrology. You're learning two new words tonight. Isn't that fun? Patrology is the, just as Christology is the study of the Christ, the doctrines of Christ, theology of Christ. Soteriology is the theology of salvation. Patrology is the theology of the Father. So, uh, empirichoresis is what? Oh, we haven't defined it yet, but we'll get there. Uh, <clears throat> Alleluia for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And then when Jesus returns in verse 15, we read, Now out of his mouth, that's the son, goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So he is ex what that is saying is he's executing the judgments of Almighty God, that is, God the Father. And then when we get to Revelation 21, 22, we read that there's no temple in the new heavens and new earth. I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. See, again, there's that distinction made between those two persons. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So that helps us to get to the understanding of who the people are, who the personages are here, because as we get into this last section, it's amazingly all about God. Because when he comes down to it, the Bible is all about God, and it's not about us. And that's one of the basic principles anybody should understand in Christianity, is when you go to church, it's all about God, it's not all about you. But that is, but more and more as we live in our existential, postmodern, self-absorbed culture, you go to most churches and it's all about you and it's not about God. God's just there as window dressing. So um, that just uh, shows how apostate we've become. Now, back to our two key verses there, Revelation uh, 21, 5 and 6. Behold, I make all things new, the Father says. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. That's the plan of God. The angelic conflict, it's all finished. It's over with. Evil has been defeated. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. That is a great passage related to salvation, the freeness of the offer of salvation. In fact, this same imagery is found back in, uh, back in Isaiah. Uh, back in Isaiah, we have in Isaiah 12, 3, Therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Again, water being used as that, uh, as that same metaphor there. And then it is also used in Isaiah uh, chapter 55, verse 1, How everyone who thirsts, Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. This is a uh, in the last part of Isaiah dealing with uh, mostly issues related to the kingdom. Salvation is a free offer. So this is, this is set up in the context of, of understanding salvation and presence in the kingdom. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who, who thirsts. So giving the water is free. I just want to make this one point. Don't forget it. Hold on to it for a couple of weeks. Write it down. But what we get into in the next two verses, which we won't get to until next, the next class, has to do with inheritance. And this is something that is earned. So it's very important to understand the contrast that's being set up here by John. Now, I'll review that again, but since we're just touching on that, uh, I <clears throat> wanted to reinforce that. Now, pausing here to go back and briefly review the doctrine of the Trinity. doctrine of the Trinity is often thought to be some sort of unique teaching to uh, Christianity and to the New Testament. But as we'll see as I go through this, it's not unique to the New Testament. It is more clear in the New Testament. It becomes uh, defined 
by Tertullian and then later those at the Council of Nicaea all the way through that progression from the Council of Nicaea 325 to the Council of, Con- uh, to the Council of Chalcedon in 451, that, that that's when the, the vocabulary and the concepts related to the Trinity are clarified and articulated. But it's in the Old Testament, uh, as, not as much as it's in the New Testament, but it's still there. Start off with the definition, uh, <clears throat> Trinity, God exists in three equal persons. We call them Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are terms related to their roles, which are sometimes described as the economic Trinity because economy has to do with administration. That's that the um, uh, Greek word oikonomia is translated dispensational, uh, has to do with the idea of an administration of something. And so uh, the three persons of the Trinity has to do with their economic or their administrative function. Maybe we could say it's their dispensational function, but that would probably just confuse people, even though it's true. It would make dispensationalism even even better. Um, God exists in three equal persons who have identical essence. They're equally sovereign, equally righteous, Equally just, equally love, equally eternal, equally omnipotent, equally uh, omniscient. That means there's nothing that the Father knows that the Son doesn't know and that the uh, Holy Spirit doesn't know. They are equally omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, immutable, and true. Now, the unity of person within the Trinity is so intimate that what can be said of one can be said of the other. Let me say that a a little different way. What can be said of one can be said of another, and if you have seen one, you've seen the other. Okay? That's how closely and intimately connected they are. Now, here is a diagram based on an early early church diagram of the, okay, we're going to build this out here. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So three distinct persons, and each one is God. They're each one fully and equally God, but on the other hand, they are distinct. The Father's not the Holy Spirit. The Father's not the i got to build that again. The Father's not the Holy Spirit. The Father's not the Son. The Son's not the Holy Spirit. But they are equally, uh, they are equal and they are distinct persons. Okay, now so often we emphasize the distinction of their persons that we forget how intimate the unity is. And that's where the doctrine of perichoresis comes in. I'll spell that for you again. That's P-E-R-I-C-H-O-R-E-S-I-S. And the definition of perichoresis uh, me is that it is the mutual indwelling. Notice that mutual indwelling. The Father indwells the Son, the Son indwells the Father, the Father indwells the Spirit, the Spirit indwells the Father. The mutual indwelling of each person of the Godhead in the other. So it is said that the three are together a dynamic, interconnecting, and intermingling unity. An interconnected, intermingling unity. They each have full and total fellowship with the other. So that when you see one, you've seen the others. That's that's the only way you can explain a couple of these rather unusual references that Jesus has. I'm just referencing one here, John 14. Jesus said, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise believe because of the works themselves. Later on in John 15, he says, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's, that's the point. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
That's what he told uh, earlier in John 14, 14, 7. That's what he told Philip. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So, And he's not talking about the physical representation. He's talking about understanding who he is. So often seeing something is a term that we use for mentally grasping or understanding something. And so it shows the unity there uh, of, the, of the Father and the Son, and the same is true uh, with the Holy Spirit. And so this was expressed by uh, the Latin term, uh, perichoresis, which talks about their interconnectedness, and Latin terms that were used were words, you don't need to write this down, you'll never use them again, in, ex- in existentia, in habitatio, and intercommunion. Now that one you might remember because it's like intercommunion, and it just indicated the closeness of their relationship. So that's a doctrine of perichoresis. So when you get into passages like in John 12, when <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus said that Isaiah saw his glory, and we go back to John, uh, go back to Isaiah chapter 6, and Isaiah sees somebody sitting on the throne, we go, well, wait a minute. If Jesus, typically what we've been taught is that based on John 12, that had to be Jesus sitting on the throne. Now, this is how this whole class connects together. Was Jesus sitting on the throne in Isaiah 6? Who's sitting on the throne in Isaiah 6? It can only be the Father. And yet, Jesus says in John 12 that Isaiah saw his glory. That's the only time Isaiah could see his glory. He's not saying he saw my person. He's saying he saw my glory. Because the glory of the Son is the same as the glory of the Father and the glory of the Holy Spirit. You can't separate those. And that's also true in a number of other passages in the Old Testament where we'll talk about God appearing to Moses. Well, was that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? No, it was God. It was the Trinity. It was the fullness of the Trinity. It's perichoresis. Does that mean that, that they saw God the Father? No, not in, that, not in the sense that they're seeing a, a face-to-face physical representation of the Father, but they are seeing a manifestation of deity, and it's the fullness of the Trinity, not just one member or another. So that all of a sudden means that we don't lose the Father in the Old Testament as just somehow he's the, the, the puppeteer behind the curtain. And we never see him. We just see the sun. There are places when, where you, do, you have a manifestation of the entire Godhead as the Godhead. And it's just referred to as God. So that is, that is what we see in Isaiah chapter 6. Now in the Old Testament, I said there are passages that talk about, that indicate the Trinity. For example, Isaiah chapter 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Now, you probably don't read it that way in your English translation. In fact, in the New American uh, Standard, it says, uh, as it does in the uh, 1917 edition of the Tanakh. Now, the Tanakh is the Jewish Old Testament. It's it's an acronym. Drop the vowels. T-N-C-H. Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Okay, the Torah is a law. Nevi'im, the prophets, Ketuvim, the writings. Those are the three divisions of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Old Testament Bible. English Bibles are organ- categorized a little differently. So the Hebrew, the Old Testament, the Jew- Jews use, is a Tanakh. Now, the 1917 Tanakh translated it like the New American Standard in uh, King James does, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But the Hebrew word there for one is echad, which doesn't always mean one in terms of a singularity. It can mean one in terms of a uniqueness. It can be one in terms of being alone, or it can be one in terms of a, of a unity. And in the 1997 Tanakh, which is the one I have, uh, I put up here on the screen, it translates it, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Which I think is the best translation. And it's similar to what we have in uh, 1 Chronicles, which is a, a comparative verse to look at, 
where uh, David says in 1 Chronicles 29.1, then King David said to the entire assembly, my son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen. That's a new King James. So it's not who, who's the singular, it's not emphasizing singularity like in a singular monotheism or Unitarian monotheism. Uh, my son Sol- Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is still young and inexperienced, and the work is great. But in the Tanakh, and this, I believe, is the, um, I'm taking this from the 1917 tra- Tanakh translation, King David said to the entire assemblage, God has chosen my son Solomon alone. See, again, it substantiates what I'm doing here is showing that translating Echad as alone is, is common in the Old Testament. This idea of translating it as one, indicating a singularity or a Unitarian view of God, is, 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 is not consistent with the primary usage of Echad in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it says that... that um, so uh, that that the woman and the man uh, le- le- left you know, le- cleave to one another, and the two became one flesh. Echad. It's a unity. It's a plurality within a unity. So that's the idea of one when it re- in, that we have in, our, in um, Deuteronomy four six. Now a couple of other key passages just to keep in mind um, in Isaiah forty eight sixteen we read. Come near to me, listen to this. Who's speaking? It's the servant of God, the the suffering servant in Isaiah 40 to 66. Come near to me, listen to this. From the time I have not spoken in secret, from the time it took place, I was there. Now the Lord God, who's that? That's the Father. The Lord God has sent me. Who's that? That's the suffering servant. And his spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. What do we have here? Like count them up. One, two, three. We have the Trinity right there in the Old Testament. Just as clear as, and, and then you can always go to other places where you have pronouns like in, in Genesis one twenty six and 27 when God says, let us make man in our image. And you have again and again, you have we, us, our used in relationship to uh, to the Father. Then you have another reference in Isaiah one. I mean Hosea, one seven. Hosea one seven uh, one six states that the Lord is speaking to Hosea, and one seven he says, "But I will have compassion on that's the Lord. I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God." Wait a minute, the Lord is speaking. The Lord says, I will deliver them by the Lord. Once again, you have at least two persons indicated in, in those verses. Uh, Isaiah fifty nine twenty one. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, there's a second person involved here that's deity. My spirit, is, which is upon you, and my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord. Uh, Isaiah 63, 9 and 10, again, uh, indicate the two persons, the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 63, 10, and uh, the Lord. And, of course, when we get into the New Testament, one of your central passages on the Trinity is Jesus speaking in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore... Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name, which indicates the essence of, uh, of who the person is, in this case, the deity of Christ. Baptizing them in the name uh, of the... And if, if there were three gods, he would have said name. So it's only indicating uh, one entity here in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, indicating the unity of the Father, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and he says, Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, he can't be there always unless he's eternal. And then 2 Corinthians uh, thirteen fourteen, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So it's very clear that the Bible teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not three persons that are so distinct that you have three gods. It's not one God. But the, the unity is so tight and so intimate that at times you lose sight of the distinction. So that when you see one, you've seen all of them.
When you hear one, you've heard all of them. And that's perichoresis. So perichoresis balances the distinction of persons. And so that helps to blend the two together. Now you have a couple of new words, patrology and perichoresis. So if you don't learn anything else tonight, at least you learned a couple of new vocabulary words. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study your word this evening, to be, uh, again, encouraged by the consistency of Scripture as we go through the uh, prophecies from the Old Testament into the New Testament. We see how everything comes together and reinforces one another without a conflict or without a contradiction. Father, we see that your plan will come together and completely resolve the problem of sin and evil, and there is real hope and real grace from you, and there is a free offer of salvation that it's not based on our works of righteousness, but on Jesus Christ and his righteousness and his death on the cross that paid the penalty for our sins. Father, we pray that you would uh, help us to understand the things that we study today and this evening, and that we'd have a greater understanding of who you are and the persons of the Godhead. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.